I want to uh, talk about a debate with a lot of people that I hear with this passage. And there's so many ways that this story is read. There's so many ways this story is taught. There's so many. You can keep diving, just like the Word of God. You always can keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, but I do want to go just a little bit more in depth with this story than just what the story reads. And, and because of what the story reads, we, we sometimes we automatically just take it and, and, and run for what it says. Uh, and, and it's okay sometimes, but not not this not this case. Uh, we have to go a little deeper. Amen. Uh, John chapter two. This is the uh, the first miracle that Jesus done uh, when he turned the water into wine. Now, I'm not that any of us do, but if you're one of the the people that use this scripture to satisfy your fleshly desires, uh, I'm gonna debunk or uh, get rid of that thought process tonight because. Oftentimes, we'll, we'll, well, the Bible says that Jesus turned the water into wine, so it's good for me to sip wine. That's not what this passage means at all. We're going to talk about it. And, and you can go a little deeper than what I'm going to go, but I ain't going to go just a tad deep. Now, I'm not condemning nobody if you drink and all that, but but you can't use this passage for, for that. Amen. Y'all y'all with me? Yes. Maybe it's always those hand for tonight. <laughs> Amen. It's okay. Uh, I, I want to read all of it, and then I want to go back and just do verse by verse. I don't want to be a long time. It's already uh, not late, but I, I just want to uh, take my time. And, in, anyways, John chapter 2, the Bible says, how many got your Bibles? <sighs> we'll give you some grace tonight. <laughs> Amen. So, so the Bible says in the third day there was a marriage in, in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage and when they wanted wine the mother of Jesus said unto him they have no wine and Jesus said unto her woman what have I to do with thee mine hour is not yet come and his mother said unto his servants whatsoever uh, he said unto you do it and there was six pots of water there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing uh, two or three firkins apiece and Jesus said unto them fill the water pot fill the water pots with water and they filled them to the brim and he said unto them draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast and they they bear it and when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said unto him, Every man uh, at the beginning do set forth the good wine, and when the men have well drunk, then that which is worse. Uh, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. And the Bible said, This is the beginning of miracles. Uh, that Jesus in Cana of Galilee, Jesus, the beginning of the miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Everybody say that. His disciples believed on him. Amen. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Father, this is a short, very sweet, good little message. I ask, Father, that you anoint me to be able to speak clearly God to your people and I want their ears to hear exactly what it is you're trying to say to the church father and we thank you for the healing that's took place in this place and I thank you for still healing God and I thank you that you're going to heal tomorrow God you're just a God that heals and father we thank you for never changing and we love you God God we love you and Jesus is mighty mighty name we pray amen and amen amen and amen how many loves the Lord amen. can we give him a hand clap I'm about kind of nervous when they turn the phones on and start recording. You might not know it, but every time something gets put on Facebook about me or the church, it gets brought to me, and 
uh, I had a, uh, a senior guy from Panther Creek. Oh, I guess I should have said before it's from. I had a senior guy, he put on Facebook, and he said, I, I went to watch this live, and that pastor, up, I seen people in the church wearing hats. And he said, if that wasn't enough, that pastor grabbed his phone and was playing with his phone on, on, on while he was in church, what's, yeah, while he was in the pulpit, what was so important. And, and I'm, I told Angel, I was like, I just want to comment back. And she's like, no, don't do it. I'm like, why? Let's explain. The phone is, I got my notes. <laughs> So if you see my phone, think I'm not on Facebook. I'm not playing games. Not this time. We'll shoot, we'll shoot zombies later. <laughs> not this time. We'll play games later. Anyways. So there's a, there's a couple things uh, that I want to talk about uh, that's happened since the service tonight. One thing is this. As Elijah, the girls, not Elijah, the girls sung that song, Let It Rain, or Build a Boat. Uh, then God's doing everything he's doing after that. And then somebody mentioned something before service about building the boat before the flood comes. Listen, this is very smart. This is a mature act. Are you ready? This is something that mature Christians would do. Uh, immaturity, you wouldn't do it, but maturity, you would do it. That you would build the boat before the flood comes. Amen. That you would get access to heaven before that the rain starts. You, and what I'm saying, I'm not saying go out there and build a little boat because the world's come to an end. What I'm saying is this. It's smart and it's wise to, to get to the place with God that you have a relationship with God before the, ba the battles ever even happen. It's smart as a mature Christian. Maybe you don't do this. You should after tonight. That before any attack, any any hindrance, any financial problems, any health problems, any any attack at all comes, that you have a relationship with Jesus, Amen. In in prayer and in His Word, and, and that you feel like you're to the place, Keith. That when I speak, He answers, and when He speaks, I can hear Him so plainly. Then the battle will come, and the battle won't affect you as much because you got a relationship with Him. But oftentimes, immaturity. Teresa, we get to the place of complacency. We, we stop coming to church as often. We stop reading as often. We stop surrounding ourselves with like-minded believers as often. And then the battle comes. The sickness comes. The finances come. Hell comes. And then we want the access. Then we want the boat. Then we want help. And it's just unwise for us to wait until the battle shows up for us to fight. Amen. It's unwise. Uh and, and I'm going to move on. But even with Noah, this is what hit my heart today. A dead man does not care what he looks like, uh, does not care what he sounds like. A man on fire does not care what he looks like, does not care what he sounds like. A man doesn't care what it looks like to everybody else. Noah did not care what it looked like to everybody else. They laughed. They ridiculed. He didn't care because he knew what God had told him. Don't matter what it looks like to everybody else. You keep on pressing. You keep on burning. Because when you burn for Jesus, when you burn for God, it don't matter. You do not care what you look like. Amen. Amen. When you burn for God, it don't care if the church is empty and you're preaching to one person or the church is 150 chairs full and you're preaching to everybody. It doesn't care. You don't, you don't, it don't matter to you. Amen. Because you sit with an assignment. Amen. Let me just tell you, tell you this and we'll go on. If you ever have the, the opportunity to do this, what I'm doing right now, do not be influenced with this because this is like 10% of the, the pastoral ministership, uh, ministership. This is only a part of, this is 5%, 10% of what pastor looks like. This is the easy part. The one-on-one -on -one part is what's difficult. The things behind closed door, the, the late hours, the phone calls, the one-on-one, the -on -one, so don't be influenced by numbers. This is just a part of it. But a man on fire ain't, he ain't or a man that's dead to the world and, and living for Jesus does not care if it's one or five thousand. Yes, Amen. It, it don't matter if there's a microphone tree or if there's not, Corey. It don't matter. What matters is, is God sent me with an assignment. And I'm going to do the assignment that God sent me to do. Whatever it looks like, I don't know, but I'll do whatever he calls me to do. Because a man on fire does not care what he looks like. Or, or, or what people think of him. On, Amen. So get that in your mind. Whatever it is that God has sent you with the assignment to do, do 
do it with all of your heart. It don't matter what everybody else. You know what God told you to do. You know what God said. That's all that matters. Noah knew what God said. He knew he ran with it. It don't matter. Everybody, We might see 15 people here. Now. God sees into the future of the thousands that's coming. The other churches that we're going to build. God sees this. We see to the point right now. Anyways, uh, a man doesn't care. He's not easily offended. I, I said that. Do not get offended when somebody says something on Facebook that's, a, that's even a sinner. They don't know no better. They're blinded. They, yeah, they, they, they ain't got the blood for sin. They, they can't know better. But don't be offended uh, by people. You know your assignment and, and stay on it. Amen. Uh, Philippians 3 and 20 talks about that we're not citizens of this world, but we're citizens of heaven and that's where we get the, the the teaching of that we're ambassadors for christ that we're just passing through this world so philippians 3 and 20 it, it talks about that we're just uh, uh citizens of heaven but we're visitors in this world so we know that that we're not here permanently we're just we're just passing through uh so and, and i said it to, to talk about this scripture in john chapter 2 uh with the water getting turned into wine. But I want to open your mind spiritually. Not just the physical aspects of water literally getting turned into wine. So it's okay for me to drink. Uh, that's carnal thinking. That's carnal mindset. I'm talking about spiritual things because we are citizens from heaven. Amen. We, we're still together. Don't get sleepy yet. we got a long ways to go. It's exciting. It's short, but it's long. <laughs> Amen. So we'll, we'll start with with some 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 teachings with numbers. Uh, uh, and I think somebody just pulled in EJ. If you want to tell them hi, come on in. We love them. Uh, I want to start with some teachings real quick. So if you're taking notes, bear with me. If not, we'll, we'll get together later. We know in the Bible. That when you see a number or a number is presented, now the teaching part might be boring, but it's a foundation to what we're going, and I hope you enjoy this as much as I do. Uh, we, when we see numbers in the Bible, it means something significant. When we see three, we see 12, we see 10. These numbers mean stuff. It's not a coincidence that when, when Peter and him caught the abundance of fish, he caught 153 fishes. That's not a coincidence. That number means something. But we have to dive in, study, find out what the number means. So I took the time for you, uh, a couple of numbers on what they mean biblically. And I'm going to go quickly. Uh, one, when you see one in the Bible, it means unity. Two is witnesses. Now there's scripture with all of this. Unity with God. Uh, unison in Psalms 133. All of that, you become two becomes one flesh. All of this unity, it's, it's one. Witnesses, two is witnesses. He sent them out two by two to be witnesses. Uh, three means perfection or completion. Four biblically means earth. Uh, five is grace. Six equals man. When you hear the number six, it, mean, it, it literally means man. Seven equals spiritual completeness or completion. Uh, eight equals a new beginning. Ten is earthly government. And twelve is spiritual authority in the Bible. I know you won't remember half of that, but there's two that I want to talk about. The two I want to talk about is three and six. Three is perfection and completion. And it's easily, easiest, best explained uh, as the Trinity, God, three and one. The perfection and the completion of God. Father, Son, Holy God. Uh, the, the Thessalonians talks about a person, body, spirit, soul. Three and one. Perfect and completion. And then we're going to talk about number six is man. Uh, you read in Genesis, man was created on the sixth day. Man labors for six days, he rests for seven. Uh, slaves in tradition serves for six years. And you can keep going on and on and on of why six equals man. And we're going to break that down. All this is so important with what we're doing right now. It's, I'm just not wasting your time. It's important. So we read in John chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says, The third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Amen. Uh, the the number three here. The Bible says that the third day there was on day three there was a marriage. So 
the number three was presented here. We're going to break this down. I hope you like this. We're going to we're going to break this down. Three is the number of perfection and completion. Genesis one, chapter one, verse nine through thirteen. Genesis one obviously is where God created stuff. Uh, the six days He created stuff. Day three, uh, the Bible talks about uh, God created the earth and, and the things in the earth and all, all of that. And you go back and read that of what God created on day three. But to the to the Jews, it's very important, uh, and, and this is why. This is the only notes I have. Maybe one more from my study Bible for this passage. It says that Jewish weddings is usually on the third day of the week, which if we go by our calendar is, is Tuesday. And it's commonly selected for Jewish weddings. One reason for this, according to the rabbis, is that the third day of creation has double the blessings and it was good. You remember God himself spoke in Genesis that every time he created something, even on day three, the Bible says that he said, and it was good. So the rabbis believe that when a person is having a wedding uh, uh, on, on the third day of the week, that they don't just receive a blessing, but they receive a double blessing. That, and that's just Jewish study. That's what they believe. The, the rabbi interpretation of this is that on the third day, the groom and his bride receive the double blessings from God in a unique, unique way in a marriage covenant. Amen. So they would get, I know this is the boring part, but we'll, we'll be able to, you'll, you'll like it. Uh, that on the third day is a double blessing. So that's the day that they always chose to get married. And that's where day three comes in. And we're going to talk about day three. And it was good from Genesis just here in a second. Verse two says that both Jesus uh, was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him that they have no wine. Jesus said unto her woman, uh, what have I to do with thee? For my hour is not yet come. Mary said that whatever he says, I, I want you to do it. There's a couple things that I got wrote down from here. This is a little tough, but it, it's good. That, that Mary said, whatever he says, and you do it. Now, now up until this point, the Bible says that Jesus never performed. Uh, up until this point, never, never did Jesus perform uh, a miracle to anybody else. Uh, it don't record of any time before this that Jesus presented a public miracle. I mean, would you agree? That's what your Bible said. This is the first public miracle that, that, that Jesus done. It, it was the beginning of his ministry. Amen. Uh, I feel like, and this is what I wrote down last night, that when Mary spoke these words, whatever he says to you, do it. That maybe a list of thoughts come through Jesus' mind. That this will be my first public miracle, and it, it will be the changing of water into wine. And, and maybe the thoughts of Jesus is this will be the opening statements to my disciples, this, this miracle, if I do it. And I'm going to tell you why I think that here in a second. But he also said that my mother said whatever he, he says, do it. So he knows what the commandment said to obey your your, your father and your mother with that your life will be blessed and, and when you dishonor or be mean to your, your mom and dad your, your life will be shortened and, and we know this uh, but maybe he, he said within himself I'll, I'll do this because my, my mom asked me to do this and I'll honor her now we're thinking of Jesus he's a human right yeah. he's still a man but he said I'll do this because my mom asked me to and I'll honor this what she says of me to do uh, right here. Now I'm going to go to verse 6, and this is where we're going to pick up and start preaching. The Bible says, And there was set there six water pots of stone, and after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. So by the numbers that I gave you a while ago, 1 through 12, we know that 3 means perfection and completion. 6 is the number of man. So it's not just a coincidence, Cliff, that Jesus said that there are six water pots, there are six pots of stone over there that's filled with water. It's not a coincidence that the number was six. Why not five? Why not seven? Why not 15? Why not 25? Why not 50? Was it because that, that God knew the exact number of jars of wine that they needed to finish out the way? What, what's the reasoning of six? I hope your mind works like mine does and you can understand why I'm going right now. But the number was six. Zachary wasn't five. Five equals perfect grace. It wasn't five. It wasn't eight. 
uh, uh, meaning new beginnings. It wasn't it wasn't earthly government and none of that. But it was six, six meaning man. Are we still together. Raise your hand if you're with me still. Half of us. Amen. Six equals the, <laughs> the number of man. Six equals man, right? So there was six pots of water setting by. Now Jesus has his servants to fill the six jars of water, the Bible says, to the brim. Then the master of the banquet tastes the wine. Now the jars was full of water. Now I want you to open your mind to this real quick. That Jesus, after he filled the water pots, got turned to wine. Jesus then told the, 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 the governor, the master of the banquet, he said, now taste this and see if it's good. I want you to understand something that in this passage, in us, just like these water pots, these water pots, it ain't just stone pots that's sitting there. This literally represents man. That when Jesus said, go get six pots, he's talking about go get man, filled with water. All of us is filled with water. Please open your mind. He said, go get the, the pots of water, the, the six pots. Six equals man. He said, go get the, the, the men. He said, I'll turn them into wine. Do you not realize that Jesus himself, the Bible said that Jesus is the fruit of the vine, which is the wine, later represented the blood of Christ, and it also represented the redemption of the new covenant. Matthew 26 through 27, the Bible says that it, the Bible said Jesus, he took the cup and gave thanks, and uh, he took the cup and gave thanks and thanked it to them, saying, drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many of the remission of sin. Jesus literally in this act, he wasn't just turning near old water into wine, but Jesus literally was saying to them, transform you from your old sin self, and I'm going to clean you up. And now that it's not just water, but I'm going to place the new wine of myself on the inside of you. At the beginning, it was sin, six, men, six pots of water, which represented man. It was man standing there in his sin self. It was man standing there in all the depression, anxiety, the things that he's going through. The man that's filled with just water, plain old men, filled with sin. Jesus said, I'm going to take the men. I'm going to transform them before your very eyes. You might have drunk the water at the beginning or the, oh, the, 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 the nasty one at the beginning. But he said, once I get a hold of these men, I'm going to transform them, clean them up, take that water out of them, purify them, shift them. So now, Governor, that when you take a drink of them, you're not drinking water, but you're drinking the new wine of my new covenant, the new wine of my redemption wine. And that's why the governor said, usually people... People get the, 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 the good one at the beginning, uh, but you want it to the end of the feast to bring out the good one. I hope I ain't lost you. I'm trying not to. But, but Jesus said that uh, I transformed them from the, the pots of water to the pots of the new wine. Now, please know that the Bible says that uh, uh, every time you see wine, it, it represents Jesus. It represents the vine, the vineyard, the the, 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 the uh, the, the grapes that's pressed down the process of the vines everything uh, that, that, that comes in play with the, the vineyard and the wines and, 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 and the little boxes that spoils the vine all of this Jesus is painting a picture here and I think it's so beautiful when we can tap into this Kenny and see that Jesus he literally sacrificed his first miracle of whatever it was going to be for when his mama said, I want you to do this miracle. And he said, you know what? I'll sacrifice the very first miracle that I'm going to do. For my disciples' sake and for the people's sake. I think it's so beautiful. What a love story when we read that Jesus literally said, you know what? The first miracle that I'll create, the first creative miracle that I show in public is literally me transforming mankind before the very eyes. It's not just about the water. It's not just about the pots. But it's about the man in his sin nature. Six equals man. It's about the man that's sitting there. And Jesus said, you can't do it by yourself. But with me, I can transform you. It's not just water on the inside of you. But I'll literally create a new on the inside of you. So when people drink you, it's not just plain old. But it's the goodness of the wine of Jesus Christ. Amen. Notice how Jesus literally... Clean the wine pot. I'm going to say man. He literally cleaned man up. And the Bible said that he said to the governor, Now, 
drink of him. He never did it, did it say drink of him before. The six pots was over there full of water the entire time. The six pots was over there. And he told us, go fill them to the brim. <laughs> fill them to the brim with water. Once I convert them, once I change them, it's not just the plain old pots, but it's the new wine. Then he said to the governor, this is what my mind went last night. When I read this, I, I read this as this. Jesus saying to the Father, now God, now Daddy, you drink them now. Drink them now, God, because they ain't just six pots of water. They're not just man in their own dirty sin nature because of the fall of Adam. But I came to purify, to cleanse them, to change them, to, to transform them. So that now, God, the governor of the feast, that's how my mind read it. Governor of the uh, governor of the feast, he called the bridegroom. And, and he told him all that. And I imagine in my mind, God saying, to, to uh, Jesus saying to God the Father, now God, now Father, drink them and see if I didn't change them. Drink them, see if they're not good. Drink them, see if I didn't transform them. No longer the dirty old pots. Yeah. Oh, but they're, they're, they're brand new. No longer are they just old water sitting there. What's that word? Stagnation. No longer are they stagnated uh, water we, we, we're in the mountains. We know what happens when you, you don't. It's not desirable. You don't want to drink it. You'll die. <laughs> Stay away from the black water. You'll die uh, when you're in the woods. Uh, the stagnation, the filth, the nasty, all of that. Now, I have to say this part too. Tradition says that these six water pots was big enough so that people that could go into the feast they would clean themselves, clean their hands, clean their feet, clean wash their face. They take the water so it's big enough that they can dip in. Uh, so you think, and I'm not saying it's dirty water, but you think of that water just sitting there. Yeah. You, you think that after the whole church done went through, the wedding done went through of cleaning the hands. I'm not saying it was nasty. I'm just right, right in your brain. You think of all of this stuff. And Jesus said, you know when you got a, thank you. You know when you got a pot, this jar that's full, the more that you dip, the emptier that it gets. Uh, the, the more empty that it gets to you, you got to fill it back up. Why do you think the first thing Jesus said, he said, fill it to the brim. Fill it all the way up. Fill it all the way up. Because when I bless them, when I change them, when I completely reverse their life, make them brand new, then I want them to live a life and a more abundant life and a more expedient life, a life to the brim that they ain't got to reach way below to get a blessing. But from the top, they're blessed and highly favored. That everything that I've given, the new wine that I've given them, it's not just little, but there's much in me. Oh, how beautiful it is. What a love story that is. When, when Christ literally says, you know what? I'll take, I'll take my first blessing, my first miracle, and show people how good that I am. How good that I am. Amen. The Bible said, Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. He said to them, draw out now, bear to the governor of the feast, and they bore it. And the ruler of the feast had tasted the water, and it was made wine. He knew not uh, that it was water at first. That's what the Bible was saying. He, he knew not that it used to be water, because it was so good. And I'm going to throw this in here while I just said it. It just went into my spirit. Do you know that, that when we get born again, when we ask for forgiveness, Corey, it's so good to God. Because it ain't when he cast our sin into the sea of forgetfulness, as far as the east is to the west, never to be remembered. He never knew that it was used to be water. But when he drunk it, and he said, My goodness, this is the best wine that ever I've ever drunk before. And a condemnation on us, we're on this side saying, God don't even love me. On God's saying side is you ask for forgiveness. I, my son's blood covered you, cleansed you. Now you've got that new wine on the inside of you. And I don't, I don't even know you used to be water. Yeah. The only thing I see is the, the, the goodness of the wine. Yeah. The only thing I see is the newness of it. I don't see the dirty stagnated. I don't see the day sin, yesterday sin. I see forgiveness. I see the blood. And you taste good to me. Yeah. Amen. Ain't that so good? Ain't that such a reassurance? That we were stuck in our condemnation of messing up. And he said, I didn't even know you was water. <laughs> The governor said, I didn't even know. The Bible said he knew not. The governor feasted and called the bridegroom. Do you know that we're the bride? 
and Jesus Christ is the bridegroom? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Do you know, man or female, spiritually, if you're a Christian, you're a woman, you're a bride. I want to say a woman, you're a bride. And, and Jesus is the husband. He, he's the, the bridegroom. Bride, man, woman, you know. Amen. Uh, and there is going to be a marriage one day. Anyways, the, the, the governor said to the bridegroom, he called to the bridegroom, and this is what he said. He said, every man at the beginning sets forth good wine. You waited to the end to, to bring forth the good, uh, the, the good wine. And, and I, I really, I made to believe that that's Jesus talking to God. Now I'm going to read on, uh, and I'm really, I'm almost done. And the ruler of the feast, the governor called the feast, and he said unto him, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, then he would bring up the good wine until, but you, thou hast kept the good wine until now. And now this is the beginning of the miracles which Jesus did and manifest his glory and his disciples believed on him. His disciples believed on him. I'm going to say it one more time. His disciples, because of this creative miracle, because the first miracle that he done, his disciples believed on him. Do you remember what, and I ain't got none of this road, I'm just do you remember what Jesus, when he asked the disciples, he said, who does men say that I am? And then Peter said, and, and, and Jesus said, what do you say, Peter? And he said, where do you think that that revelation came from? Who's to say that the revelation didn't come all the way from the, which Holly's right, God said flesh and bone, he revealed this from my Father in heaven. But who's to say that revelation didn't somewhat come from his mindset from this water into wine? You done changed. I see the, the transformation that you can do, Jesus. I know that you're the Son of God. I know that you can play, you can take the plain old man and convert him and create in him new wine. Uh, oh, yeah. New wine. And who's to say Peter didn't have that revelation on the inside of him? Now, I want to throw this out here. Traditions say that they believe, some writers, some theologians say that they believe that this wedding was one of Jesus' kinfolk because Jesus and his disciples and his own mommy was invited. They also believe that it was, some even say they believe it's one of Jesus' other brothers that got married. Uh, and that's the reason it was Mary who said, you know what, they're out of wine. So she took it upon herself as, that's just some studies. Uh, 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 and some studies actually say that they believe it may have uh, been one of John the writer uh, one of his families because John was the only book that recorded this this in-depth story with this uh, and you can go every direction that you, you want with this but uh, that's just different things that you know they, they talk about uh, but there's a couple more things I, I want to touch base real quick 3 through 5 says this that the, they ran out of wine and he said whatever he, he says do it No, no, let's, let's skip that. Did y'all, we need new microphones. Is that better? We, we need a new system. We got eight microphones and three and a half works. Well, eight minutes. That's the truth. Uh, that's sad, isn't it? <laughs> Amen. Y'all bear with me. I'm going to put my three pages here together. Three different. My three and a half books here. Okay, yeah. This is what I wanted to get to. Now, if you think of this physically, you think of this traditionally, maybe you're, you'll read and you'll learn. Uh, obviously, it's an embarrassment when you run out of food or something in a wedding. Exactly. If you're, if you're running out of food, man, we'd have laughed at you. That's why they had like three days worth of food. God, it was good. Anyways, uh, it's a, and it's embarrassment. Studies show that traditionally back then that if you ran out of wine, it's really it's a disgrace uh, to your family that that you you ain't wealthy enough to keep enough wine for everybody, and uh, it's even an insult to the the bride's mom and dad. Like this is who my daughter is marrying into, you know. Uh, so traditionally, it was an embarrassment for the bride and them to run out of wine. 
Jesus' heart. Listen to me. Sometimes we spiritualize a little too much. Let's just talk about Jesus and his heart for a second. Jesus' heart is this, that it's an act of mercy that I do this miracle for this man and this woman. Because to them, it's an embarrassment. If they run out of, in their family, it's an embarrassment. So the act of mercy, I can do the miracle. I, 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 I've got enough mercy for them uh, that I'll, I'll do this miracle. So he said, you know what? I'll, I'll do it. Then his mom said, do it. yes, I, I'll do it. Amen. And, and this is what I want to say. Sometimes when we over-spiritualize stuff, we miss the whole mark when the very act of love can fix everything most of the time. Amen. Amen. If we just show the love, EJ, we just show the love of Jesus. We we present the, the mercy. I got this. I can help you. I can do. I can. I can help. It's the love part, and I think that's why Corinthians thirteen speaks of so much about uh, all the gifts of faith, but love stands. Charity will stand uh, because it's the mercy side of Jesus that says, you know what? I got your back. That if I can help it. I'll stop this embarrassment that you're about to go through. So I'll create the, the wine uh, for you. One, one, one more key. Then I'm going to go to 10 and I'm, I'm closing, really. I told you it's very short. Uh, this part in verse 10, the Bible said, this is no, I can make a noise too long. Yeah. Jesus said unto him, every man, a bunch of devils up here. Y'all hear me? Yeah. 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 Who needs a microphone? Audrey screwed up. I can hear you. But uh, in verse 10, the Bible says that every man at the beginning does set forth the good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. And, and this is the notes that I have with that. This could represent uh, to the people. Because at this time, I want you to realize that at this story, before the cross, before the, the resurrection, all this, in their mind, they're, they're somewhat still yet under the law of Moses. Amen. Amen. They're still going by the laws. They, they, they still, why do you think when, when people met Jesus, they'd come to him and say, well, the Bible says, the law says that, uh, 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 what is that? Jesus said that if somebody hits you on the right side, you turn to the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Because the law says an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So that tells you they're in the law. But the law says this. Jesus said, well, if you can look on one of those many vultures. So they're still in the law mindset right now. I believe with all of my heart that at this time, uh, that this could represent to the people that the second is better than the first. That Jesus coming is greater than the first, which to them the first was Moses. That Moses was represented first. Jesus comes to be represented last. And the governor said that, you know what? You saved the best for last. The, the last is better than, than the first. And, and there's multiple reasons uh, of, of why. But you, you remember, this is the first miracle that Jesus done, was turning the water into wine. If you read your Bible, the first miracle that Moses done uh, was turning the, the water into blood. Now, the significance with this was Jesus saying that Moses in the law well, was for death. But Jesus said, I didn't come uh, to bring death, but I come to bring life. Yeah. That I'm going away with the death mentality of the water getting turned into to blood, but I'm turning the water into wine. That through me, through the wine, you have the newness through, through me, through Jesus Christ. That it's not through me that you're condemned to hell, but through me I bring life forevermore through the cross. So the, the governor said the great the second's greater than the first. I really feel like Jesus saying, No, you're, you're right, governor. But because the first was Moses and the law and death. Law brings forth death. Yes. And I'm gonna just say this because I've been studying, I love it. That's why that when they removed the top off the Ark of the Covenant, the law was presented. The, the mercy seat was not there. The mercy seat was the mercy of God. When they knocked the mercy seat out and they looked down into the Ark, the law got presented. And when you just have law with no mercy, you die. That's why 52,000 men of, y'all know the story, they got killed. 
Because the mercy seat got removed. The mercies of God got removed. When the mercies of God gets removed, the only thing that's left is the law. Did I lose you? No. So the law got presented. And when the law gets presented by itself, judgment happens. When it's just the law, it's dead. So Jesus said, you know what? Law, Moses represents the law. That's what Moses, he's, he's the lawkeeper. He got the law. He represents the law. And the only reason he got the law because things were so chaotic and God had to put things back in order. And once the order came, Jesus showed up. And he said, I'm not turning this, this man, the six pots of water, I'm not turning man into blood, into the condemnation of the law, which yes, brings forth death. But I'm representing the blood. I'm representing the new wine. I'm representing the new covenant. I'm representing the newness of the cross that, listen, before the cross, it was an old covenant. After the cross, it's the new covenant. Now, I don't know why, please forgive whoever done this, but do you know that, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is not the beginning of the New right. Testament? On, the on. beginning of the New Testament is Acts, after the resurrection from the cross. Right. Everything yes. before the cross is represented in the Old Testament, yes. which represents the law. But when you add the mercies of Jesus, yes. uh, Come on. that's why he changed man from water to the new wine. Yes. See, we miss it because we're so carnal-minded, people so carnal-minded, that, you know what, this gives me a license to drink. No, no, no. This gives you a revelation that Come Jesus on. has the ability to change you, cleanse you, set you in your right mind, creating you the new covenant, the new way, the new way of Jesus through the cross, through his blood. Amen. That's, Amen. Why the, that's why the second is far greater than the first. Yes. Oh, it's good. Yes. Good. So it's greater than the sacrifices uh, offered. <coughs> now, again, please forgive me. I've been, I, I love the, the Ark of the Covenant, the Tabernacle, and all that. If I'm not careful, I can just spend hours right here. If I'm not, it'll take me a few minutes. But that's why it's so important that we remember what Hebrews said. We, it's so important what the Bible said. I think it's Hebrews chapter 10. When it talks about uh, that they would go into the, the holy place and remember that they would sprinkle the, the anointing oil that was made from Exodus we've been studying on. They would sprinkle it on the altar of incense. And the Bible says once a year they would go in and sprinkle the blood of bulls and goats. And the blood would be presented and God would come down. The high priest would go in once a year. And, and, and then that's where man would, would talk to God. One high priest, one man would talk to God for everybody. That's why it's so important that we remember that Hebrews chapter 10. <coughs> it talks about uh, how that the veil was torn from top to bottom when Jesus died on the cross. And the earthquake happened. He ripped the veil because he was the high priest that went in, presented his blood, and because of his blood being presented on that, the, uh, on on the mercy seat and, and all that stuff, the, the veil was torn. And now that not just one man, but every man, six, the, the number of man, the pots, all men, all men, not just one, all, every one of us, sinner, saved, whatever, man, woman, boy, girl, child, all that. <coughs> All can experience his blood. All can experience going into the most holy place. All of us. Amen. Amen. Every one of us. It don't matter how far we've gone. We can't go in without the blood. But we get the blood applied, get forgiveness, in our, then we can walk on in. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's so smart. God's so good way to put this thing together. There's one more thing I want to mention. I'm closing. Uh, do you realize, and I don't know, I've never really realized it until last night. Do you know the Bible says, you see what it was? You see what it was walking in the hallway? The, the Bible says that, uh, you, you remember with Moses when he was leading the children of Israel, the Bible said, uh, 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 well, a smoke by day and uh, 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 fire by night. Y'all remember that scripture? Uh, where Moses was in the wilderness and, and, and he, God would lead the, the, the children of Israel with the cloud of smoke and the fire. Carnally thinking, Keith, my mind automatically said, Zach, that that was a literal cloud that would come above the children and they would walk because the heat was so hot, it would shut them down. Nighttime, it was so cold, so the fire would, God would present fire and it would warm them up physically. That's completely wrong. If you study this out, the Bible says that you got the holy place, the, I mean, the, 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 the holy place, the most holy place. In the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was, 
that once that God would, uh, they would present the blood and all that, that the, the smoke would ascend to heaven from the sacrifice. And that God would come down and commune with man. But do you know that once they was walking in the wilderness, that that smoke, God would literally make that smoke come down. And once the smoke was there, they knew to stand still. Once the smoke would ascend up, they knew, okay, we've marched. The smoke goes this way. We go this way. The smoke will go this way. And it would be the same thing with the fire by night. Ain't that so awesome? Yeah. Uh, it's not just the physical, what we're thinking. No, but it's God's presence. Yeah. Yeah. The Ark of the Covenant's God's presence in the most holy place. Wherever they move the tabernacle, wherever they move the tent, wherever they move the Ark of the Covenant, God's smoke, God's presence, God's flame would be so burned upon the altar. And they knew within themselves. If God says go, we're going to, if God says stop, if it's sustaining, we don't lose. But if it's up, if it's, it's lifted up, if it's elevated up, we know God's saying march forward. Through that, God brought safety and you're not being on all that stuff. But I think it's so important that we, our carnal thinking gets shifted because we're spiritual beings. Uh, that Philippians says that we're, we're citizens of heaven. We're, we're heavenly beings. Though we're fleshly, we're born again into the spirit. And actually, when we think of these things, we have to think spiritually. They didn't just turn water into wine to get people drunk and, and, and we've tampered away with farming. I mean, it was, it wasn't, it was, you can drink as much water as long as you fucking. It wasn't about that. It was not about the miracle. It, it was about saving the embarrassment. But the whole miracle with that was, was that we would have the revelation that this is the Messiah. This is the one that could create you, the man. He could create man new again. On the third day, uh, he, God created all this stuff, and he said within himself, and I, I, I made it, and it was good. I made it, and it was good. So they would have the Jewish weddings on the third day for a double blessing, double unity, double whatever you want to call it. But it was double good to, to the traditions. And I think it's so beautiful that Jesus, I'm not saying he sacrificed it. What I'm saying is this. He told Mary, he said, Mary, my well, mother, my time has not yet come. What, what am I to do? It's not yet time for me to create miracles or to show people who I am. But I think it's so beautiful, Keith, that a loving God would show his people, King, his disciples, his realm, that, that was around. Mary knew. Mary said, listen, whatever he says to do, just do it. Yeah. And at the same time, they said, what do you want me to do? I ain't any time for me to do this. She didn't question it. She didn't go back and forth. She turned to the servants and said, hey, whatever this man says to do, you do it. She knew. But I think it's so beautiful, Alex, how a, a loving God, merciful Savior, used the very first miracle, the very first miracle in your word is to say, you know what? Get these six pots. Fill them up with water to the brim. And when they scoop, it looks like water now, but when they scoop down, it's new wine that I've created. I think it's so beautiful how God said that six is a number of men. You take the men, fill them up to the brim. To other people, it looks like water. But when you take a dip and see, they're, they got new wine. You, you might see the same old, look like the same old tree from afar off. But when you come take a bite of their fruit, it's good for them. Amen. It's good fruit. It's not fruit of the flesh. It's fruit of the spirit. Taste and see that they're good. And, and, and it, none of that might not mean nothing to anybody else. But I do think that, in a sense, that was Jesus, the bridegroom, yeah. talking to the governor of the feast, his father, governor, authority, sitting in high places. Yes, come on. Yes. Come on. Yes. Ain't that awesome? Yes. Now, Daddy, now, now taste them. They're good. Because of the new covenant, because of my new wine, because of uh, uh, because of what I've done in him, and the Bible says that because of this miracle, that his disciples looked upon him and they believed. Amen. Because of that miracle, I guess that's about it. That's all I got. That's all I got.
I hope that gave you fresh revelation with that scripture. And, and, and I hope that you can take what I keep the little bit that I've given you and just go home and just spread it out on the table and have a feast with it. Because I'm telling you, this is just an appetizer of the feast that's in that story. There's so much more in that story that you can read. The, the water pots are stone. Why is it called stone? What's the point of the stone? You know, there's so much more. Amen in God's word.